Uh, Gar is co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative, which is an innovative think tank developing new models for sustainable, equitable, and cooperative community, community development. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, etc. He's been profiled by the New York Times, Associated Press, People Magazine, and so on. He's been a guest on uh, news programs like Meet the Press, Larry King Live, Charlie Rose Show, and The O'Reilly Factor, which should be an interesting story there. Um, so what we're going to do over the course of the next hour is uh, basically spend the first half hour just chatting. And then for the second uh, 30 minutes, uh, we'll field questions together, which you uh, are welcome to submit. Uh, as you're looking at the screen, you'll see a uh, box on the right-hand side. And you can type questions into that box at any time during this show. And uh, during the second half, we will be looking at those questions and talking about them. So, Gar, hello. Good to be with you. Hey, hi, Richard. Nice to see you, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Last time we were together was, I think, at Harvard University uh, at a, uh, a seminar on the new economy that was put on by some of the students there. And I was really excited to see an article uh, you had written just um, a few days ago about sort of all the activity that's going on around this idea of a new economy. And uh, you just told me a few minutes ago before uh, our call started, or before the public part of the call started, that that's only the first part in a uh, several part series. So I guess there's uh, more for folks to look forward to there. Yeah, the, uh, it's very interesting because um, I think there is something that's kind of shifting this spring in terms of uh, not only awareness that there is a need for a new economy, and I'm sure we're going to talk about what that really means, but uh, people getting going on it and all scale co-ops, trying to raise theoretical problems, trying to conference after conference after conference, trying to something they can do local, also national strategies. Um, the New Economics Institute, which has a were totally oversubscribed. At the, it's going to be at Bard College. And so they had to you know, say, sorry, we're, we can only take 500 and we can't take any more. We'll, next year we'll plan for 1,000. Uh, that kind of thing's happening. Uh, Co-op conferences having the same experience. So uh, um, it's encouraging to see that kind of activity. The five-part series on, on all internet, but uh, it's been picked up by Common Dreams and Huffington Post, and uh, I've seen it a couple other places as well. So I think we'll we'll see more discussion of this, and it's simply a review. Uh, I have the first piece, but there's simply a review of a lot of things going on in different areas of community economic development, uh, alternatives to the big corporation, banking. Ellen Brown has a really wonderful piece on, you know, where do we go in the banking finance. The beginning, uh, it's getting to be both an on-the-ground process and a much more sophisticated, uh, serious, theoretical development of the kind that, you know, the end of your most recent book takes up as well, Richard. Yeah, well, uh, uh, the, the frame that uh, was set for, for this um, conversation was inequality in the era of economic contraction. And I, I wonder if it might be good just to start there um, and, and talk a little bit about, uh, about the global context right now, because we are seeing uh, unprecedented levels of economic inequality, not only in the United States, but also uh, rapidly growing economic inequality in China and uh, Germany, India. Uh, most of the countries, in fact, that have seen substantial economic growth over the past a uh, couple of decades are also seeing really dramatic increases in economic inequality. Uh, so, you know, what is this going to mean as we uh, enter this era where economic growth is just no longer so easily possible? As long as the economic pie was growing, then inequality seemed like it was a uh, you know, it was a bitter pill. Nobody liked it. But there was the promise that uh, 
you know, the rising tide would, would eventually lift all boats. Uh, China you know, getting to be rich was glorious suddenly. And, uh, and there was the hope, I think, and there probably still is among a lot of people, that eventually everyone is going to benefit from uh, this, this uh, huge economic boom. But if that doesn't happen, if the engine of growth stalls out, uh, isn't uh, all of this economic inequality going to become uh, a huge social and political problem? Uh, and uh, uh, of course, you could say that you're already seeing the beginnings of that with the uh, Arab Spring, the, uh, uh, the massive demonstrations in Greece and Spain, the Occupy movement, uh, and so on. Um, is what I'm describing, is, does that fit with what, what you're seeing as well? Uh, broadly speaking, I, I agree, and it's, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's a tra the trend, there's a double barrel, I'm sure there are more barrels than, than two, but at least two barrels. One is the, the decay of the growth strategy, the decay of growth, um, which meant that you could keep the problem going without having, which is what you're, you're talking about. Um, and they've lost, I think we've lost, the advanced systems have lost the capacity to manage these systems. Uh, I sometimes think that this was an aberrant moment in the middle of the 20th century when World War II and the post-war boom uh, temporarily consolidated a political capacity, political alliances, social democracy in Europe, liberalism here, to manage growth enough to keep the, the lid on. Um, I think that's over, certainly in this country, and you see it on the periphery of Greece and probably in Spain, periphery of Europe, Greece, Spain, Italy, maybe Ireland, we'll see, um, to say nothing of the rest of the world, that means that there's going to be more conflict. Um, that's, I mean, one level, more conflict of the kind we're talking about. One of the things I've seen recently, and you, I'm sure you've seen it, that the top 400 individuals, and this is, I checked this figure out several times, 400 people, individuals, have more wealth in the United States, the bottom 160 million people. That's a, that kind of concentration when people are in economic and social pain, it's not simply the 1%, which is bad enough, but the numbers are, are really medieval and the pain levels are growing. So I think that's one piece of it. The other part of it is people are beginning to explore um, very different kinds of economic strategies, which have to do with very different, uh, you know, return to community, return to the land, um, lower level, more commensurate with the, the probability of re reduced uh, resource capacities. So there are a couple of things, lots of things going on, but those are the two big ones. Yeah. Well, in uh, in countries like Greece, as the as the formal economy stumbles, what tends to happen is the emergence of uh, of more of an informal economy, uh, black market uh, in all sorts of things, but also people. Uh, going back to more subsistence levels of agriculture and, and uh, 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 working more in communities as, as the, the big corporations start to fail. Do you see that uh, as, a, as a likelihood also? Well, I think, I think that is happening. And the questions become how much and where and whether or not there's a way to consolidate a new um, systemic model that can operate at that level. I just spent some time with uh, Grace Boggs, and who's done you know very interesting work along these lines in Detroit, the, you know, the urban farming and, and urban agriculture and urban uh, training of people as well, and also bringing the generations together, older and young, re reconstituting the local culture. So uh, I think that to a substantial degree, that piece of the puzzle is going to have to expand. Uh, I don't think that means the end of all technologies. I mean, I think there's a, you know, these are essentially very wealthy systems that still can be, um, without the growth factor, can be moderated. Uh, you know, the United States today uh, produces about $190,000 of real income, whatever real income, that's the GDP number, whatever that really means. But nonetheless, it's a crude measure. $190,000 for every family of currently now you can cut that down and make it a hundred thousand or fifty thousand, and you you know fifty thousand is the median income, and you can go radically down, and you still have a, a high level of income and a high level of resource 
uh, capacities in this system. Now, that's probably not transferable to globally, but uh, somewhere between the you know really down down to the earth, return to the earth, and a technology strategy, I think is going to have to be developed uh, over time. A lot of it depends on what we do on, on energy, obviously. It, it, it's interesting that so much of the uh, focused on uh, on Europe right now, um, particularly particularly Greece. Uh, we are living at at the end of uh, what some economists are calling the biggest credit bubble in in human history. Uh, I think since 1980, I think. Uh, Debt has grown faster than GDP in, in virtually every single year. Um, so uh, it, it, it's interesting that this is showing up uh, now in Europe, with, which has this, uh, you have 17 countries, each with its own uh, national debt, but a common currency so that uh, if uh, if debt becomes a problem, uh, none of those 17 countries can uh, negotiate their way out of it by devaluing their currency. So um, the, the, suddenly we have this, this crisis erupting and it's like it's likely also to uh, wash uh, across to our shores via uh, derivatives uh, purchased on Wall Street uh, derivatives, basically insurance policies against uh, government bonds of the, of the European countries. And then here in this country, we have a situation where after the, uh, the November election, we have all of these uh, uh, triggers set to go off with regard to uh, the uh, U.S. budget uh, to a, a compromise deal that was worked out uh, last year, when the Republicans sort of uh, held a held a gun to the head of the <laughs> of uh, Obama and the rest of the country regarding uh, 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 the uh, debt ceiling, uh, so what do you think? Are is this uh, are these problems likely to blow up in the next few months, or do you think they can sort of be papered over for for another few years or so? Are I, I talk to a lot of people these days who are really worried, who think that, uh, you know, we our, the economy is, is getting set to sort of go off the cliff with, just within the next few months. You know, the, um, in one sense, we don't have an economic problem at all. It's a real, it's, we still have a resource base. But we, we, don't have a, we don't have the political capacity to manage the economic problem. So uh, it would not surprise me if in the, the Europeans fail to solve the problem and the euro unru begins to unravel. It, it's unpredictable. There's a lot of irrationality both on the, within the countries that are being badly hurt, within Greece, within Spain, within Italy even, um, and a lot of politics that went, may make a very severe challenge. And similarly, you know, within the Germany, for instance, there is politics that has resists making a moderate uh, solution. You, Germany, you know, has benefited hugely from the common market. They, they're sitting there blaming the Greeks. But it's like the United States, uh, I saw a friend of mine uh, talking about this recently, like the United States used to want to set the Washington consensus around Latin America. The Germans want to hold that whole system together uh, without taking, you know, the hegemon's responsibility to manage it. They've been doing very well on exporting to the internal market to all these poor countries. Um, they don't like the idea of, of picking up the extra costs. So, but the political structure doesn't fit it. So that very well could fall apart. Uh, it is not by any means under control. And the United States similarly. I mean, we've, we've had this, uh, it's not just the Republicans. It is the Republicans now and the, the uh, right wing Republican Party doesn't want to play. And we're going to get this huge tax increase. The Bush tax cuts go off. We're going to see big cuts left over, as you're pointing out, when the trigger gets hit from the, the deal that they made, that they're going to make these big cuts in both social and military. They'll probably moderate that. But there's irrationality in the system. They used to be able to put together corporations and labor and a consensus to kind of work their way through compromises. I think that that's over. And if it doesn't happen this time, uh, that is to say in the after the election, that when all these triggers hit, 
It'll happen sometime down the line because of the pressures are just too good. One of the things that, you know, we've all been brought up uh, in the era when social democracy or liberalism kind of worked out a deal, or economic growth, which is now challenged, and labor unions, which were able to support the Democratic Party enough to some social programs and to constrain the corporations and sort of balance the system. Well, labor unions have gone from 35% of the labor force down to 7% in the private sector now, 11% all, all told. So the power of balancing on the progressive side, the institutional power, is really declined. So I think that means that it's just very hard to resist the right wing, and it's hard to cut a rational deal from the point of view of managing the old corporate system. So I think we're in for a long period of decay and stumbling and probably some violence. But also, um, the positive side of that is people are beginning to see, you know, something is profoundly wrong here. It's a wake-up time when, when solutions don't come. And what I'm seeing and, and what I think is the hopeful side is that more and more people are understanding, as you know, Occupy showed this. It was, what was important about Occupy, not only the taking of action, but the huge response to it, which means a lot of people must have felt in the country at, at large, felt something's really wrong and responded. And I think that's where the beginning of positive action starts. So um, even in the midst of this decay and, and really irrationality of the political process, uh, we're seeing these positive efforts, the kind of things we're talking about, worker-owned companies, co-ops, land trusts, back to the land, rural development, uh, take on the banks, move your money, uh, conferences, f figuring out where to go, what's the next system look like. There's an explosion of this kind of activity. And you know, I see it as, a, as a, an economist, political economist, but also as a historian. This kind of thing happens is the prehistory. It's the early phase, potentially, of the next great progressive era. We'll see if we can do that, but this is what you have to get first, awareness that something's wrong. That's really huge, because people taking for granted you can't, that everything's okay, nothing happens. But the awareness and the pain levels, and then the beginning of experiments, ideas, and new strategies at the local level that might become regional and national, ultimately. Most of the New Deal, for whatever it was, for what it was, was developed in the state laboratories and the local laboratories first. And I think that kind of thing is to happen in a very different way, characterized uh, also by changing who owns things, democratizing wealth, co-ops and worker-owned companies rather than corporations. Uh, that model, close to the ground. So, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a careful optimist, but I don't think we're without hope. And if you look at what people are beginning to say in terms of, you know, it's time to roll up your sleeves and do something. Uh, as a result, in reaction to all of this. Yeah, and it, it, it seems also to me that it's, it's really important to um, be able to frame uh, what's happening in terms of, of convincing reality-based stories. Uh, what I'm saying, I think, is that, uh, uh, you know, people are experiencing economic pain. And, uh, and that crisis is going to be an opportunity for someone. And probably most likely those who are able to uh, tell a, a convincing story about why the pain is happening and, uh, and whose fault it is and what to do about it. Now, uh, you know, it's possible to come up with all kinds of stories in this situation. I think it's, a, you know, it, maybe the, the kind of story that, I don't know if it's the kind of story everybody wants to hear, but the reality is, you know, this pain is happening not necessarily just because of some uh, group of evil, nefarious people somewhere, but, you know, we, to a certain extent, we're all complicit in uh, the creation of this consumer economy that's based on, on debt and ever-increasing rates of, of extraction of renewable and non-renewable resources, something that basically just can't go on. And now we've, we're kind of reaching the limits to that. And, um, uh, you know, the, again, the tendency is to want to find uh, scapegoats and, uh, uh, and use that as the basis for, for social conflict. Whereas if we're really going to get through this uh, as an organized society, we've got to do it on the basis of cooperation. 
So how do you how do you tell stories that help people understand why this is happening to them uh, in a way that fosters cooperation rather than just scapegoating and more social conflict? Uh, that's something that we, we talk a lot about here at, uh, at Post Carbon Institute, and I think it's going to be a real key in, in, the, in the times ahead. If Occupy, for example, can, can uh, do more of that, I think it, it would be really helpful to their cause. Yeah, I think the key to, to that is actual on-the-ground projects that people can do that are in some way cooperative projects. We're seeing, uh, you know, as you probably know, we've been involved with uh, work in Cleveland, in a very neighborhood, um, you know, average income 18,000 and 40% unemployment black neighborhood. But the reconstruction there of an integrated group of co-ops, not little ones, but big ones that are significant scale uh, linked together to build the community, but owned by the workers, um, and also using these uh, existing institutions, like hospitals and universities buy a lot, uh, using that purchasing power to help stabilize the community building structures and we're seeing uh, it, people get it. They understand that this is a different way to, uh, to go forward in a community. But it is not the only one. There are many, many projects like this that I think are, they give people not only the idea that we have to build a cooperative solution, but something practical. Um, there's a website which I maybe should mention called www.community-wealth. Put the dash in. And we survey these kinds of things. There are hundreds of them on the ground. Uh, one of the things people don't know, they think there's nothing, well, what should I do? Well, what you can find is that people know lots of things to do, and it isn't that you can't do something. If they put in a poor neighborhood of Cleveland with 40% unemployment and 18,000 median family income, you can do it anywhere if you want to. So in a sense, there's a huge amount of, you know, I'm, that's even, there are many other things like there are wonderful agriculture projects in cities and also connecting cities to farmers. There are very interesting projects and energy projects. There is a basis of laying the groundwork for something beyond. Um, I don't think we'll be without conflict. I think there's a conflict aspect of this too, but the central issue is rebuilding a vision of a different society. Um, because I think the you know the, the banks and big corporations that are in the large and that one percent or those four hundred uh, want to hold on to the system they've got, uh, so that's going to be challenged in a sense over time. But building the new is really critical, uh, both in practice but also clarifying a vision, in clarifying an idea of how we build a different society from the ground up in terms of institutions. How do you stabilize local communities? Uh, rather than, you know, cities like Cleveland were 900,000. They're now 300 and, or just under 400,000. That you can't have a democracy when the people are thrown away. I mean, basic, and the carbon content is thrown away, and then you have to rebuild in the own carbon costs. So how do you stabilize communities? And, you know, we've written that the book you mentioned, America Beyond Capitalism, takes up some of that, but other people are working on how you actually begin to think about if you don't like corporate capitalism, you don't like socialism, what do you want? And how does it look, work, operate? And why would it be better? And how do you deal with the growth problem? And how do you stabilize communities? So these are both practical problems. They're cultural problems, but they're also intellectual problems. We, you know, they, they take ideas. And there's a lot of people thinking about this, and, and necessarily so. It's a very creative period, even in the midst of the pain. Um, so I often encourage people, you know, often Chairman Mao said that, that power grows out of the barrel of a gun. And the uh, American women's movement said back in the 60s, no, 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 it's, it comes out of a half a dozen women getting together and reading and getting some coffee or pizza and talking and figuring out theory as well as action and then figuring out what to do and then supporting each other. And I think that's the kind of thing we need to do is people learning what's being done in other cities, what's being done in other places, and also the theory of where we're going and then get out there and do it. Um, so I, I, in a way, you don't have to urge this. I think it's beginning to happen. Uh, people are doing it without really talk. There's a lot of talk, but it's, there is something bubbling that is, uh, I'm not a, not a utopian optimist, but I do see an enormous amount of energy being driven by pain, being driven by the fact that people sense something's really wrong, being driven by unemployment, being driven by students not finding jobs, 
but also an awareness that the old system doesn't work. It isn't fulfilling its promise. It's not producing equality. It's not producing democracy. It's not producing liberty. We've got more people in prisons seven times per capita more in prisons in this country than all the other advanced countries. So something at the, America, at the level of values isn't working, and I think people sense that. And then forcing people to rethink where we're going. It's, it's a very, very important time. Yeah. Um, forgive me for uh, bringing back the sort of dark perspective, but if we are sort of uh, on the brink of perhaps another really drastic uh, economic downturn like 2008, only, only perhaps much worse this time, um, again, perhaps months uh, away. Um, is there anything communities could be doing now to sort of inoculate themselves or uh, uh, prepare, or, or households for that matter, for uh, you know pretty pretty dark economic times? Uh, do you think all, you know getting an alternative currency started now, for example, could be an insurance policy if? Uh, if uh, national currency becomes uh, more dysfunctional in, in the years ahead, or you know, what what kinds of strategies do you think might be most helpful in that, you know, taking that that frame? Well, if it, you know, I'm I'm pessimistic that people are going to in advance uh, prepare for a major crisis uh, in more than marginal ways. Um, possibly some people will, and, and to the extent people are, uh, you know taking care of the like, food supplies in many places. That means developing gardens and working in, in community gardens. Uh, in some places you can set up, you can begin to do alternative currencies, which we can multiply the resource base and, and draw on what's available in the community in a different way and in self-sufficiency or more self-sufficiency. Um, and so, and there are models of that going on, you know, in many parts of the country, in, in uh, Ithaca, Ithaca Dollars, and in the Berkshires, Berkshire, those people have experimented enough. So there's plenty to learn. Um, I suspect the crisis will be less of a sharp break, though that's possible, than growing decay and growing stagnation marked up and down by ripples up and down, so that it'll be an ongoing deepening sense of decay and pain and loss of belief in the present. Um, one of the things about the system is that the government is so much bigger as a floor level. In, you know, in 1929, the government was 11 percent of the economy. It's now 30 to 35 percent, depending upon what the denominator of the fraction is of the recession, the, GDP, the economy, GDP is lower. Um, so that the total collapse scenario of the 1930s, I think, less likely, but rather a deepening crisis and stagnation and worsening up and down, um, but ongoing and deepening problems. Now, it is possible that you could have a major financial breakdown. That's certainly within range. Um, but I suspect it's going to be more, uh, but I sometimes think stagnation, stalemate, and decay marked by very severe moments of crisis, and then back to stale stagnation, decay, and, and uh, stalemate. But who knows? I, what I would what I would say is prepare as much as you can if you if you can get it together. Yeah. Well, I think we're we're in pretty broad agreement on <laughs> these issues, uh, and uh, it's we're about halfway through the, the call now. So I wonder if this might be a good time to uh, switch over to uh, questions and. Uh, I don't see them on my screen, but my guess is that uh, uh, we've, we've had a few questions typed in up to this point. Oh, okay, here's one. Is there really any remotely realistic possibility that individual concerned citizens could counter the misinformation machine of industry? Oh, boy, that's an that's a interesting one. Um, yeah, well, there, there certainly is a misinformation machine out there, and we, we see it at work in uh, all sorts of areas with regard to uh, uh, climate change and uh, uh, 
all virtually all aspects of the economy. Um, I guess you know one thing I would say is that I see a lot more healthy cynicism among especially young people these days about those kinds of uh, misinformation messages. You know, uh, the, the downside of, of that sort of cynicism is that a lot of people just don't believe anything. But, uh, <laughs> but there, uh, it seems to me that there's, there's uh, uh, a lot more sort of free space in the, uh, in the, in the intellectual realm that's waiting to connect with a, uh, a clear and helpful uh, message and set of information. What do you think, Bob? Uh, I think that's true. I think the, um, there is real cynicism about the, the national media, I mean, including on the right. I mean, the right wing attacks the establishment media and correctly from, in the sense that they, they're right to doubt it very often. But also, um, you know, a lot of young people just don't bother with it anymore. There are the, lots better sources of information on the Internet. Uh, newspapers? Who reads newspapers? So there, there's a lot of information if you want it. In that sense, we're, this is, we're blessed. This is the powerful information sources that, with the modern technology. Uh, that's new. That didn't exist, and it's a, a spectacularly important. Uh, the thing that I think most people don't really um, normally think about is historical development. That is to say, if you were in Miss, sometimes I put it this way, my heroes are the people in Mississippi in the 1930s and 40s who understood there was a historical process at work. And it may look dark, and it looked very dark then, much darker than for anybody who wanted social change than most people now have you would be hung, and before you were hung, you were tortured if you, if you got out of line in Mississippi. But some people understood that there was a slow build-up, step-by-step, in the dark time, as the way you create the basis for the next big push. Now, that's historical movements work that way. So I'm aware that lots of people are cynical about, as the question is, is there any real, remote, realistic possibility that individuals concerned could counter the misinformation? Well, at the moment, today, in five minutes, no. But if you look at this as an evolving process and think about every historical movement, the women's movement, the environmental movement, the civil rights movement, exploding over time, then you begin to see that what we're really talking about is laying the foundations for the next big push. And that's a step-by-step -step process, um, indeed, and, and it, you know, if you read any history, if you're serious about it, you'll find that happens a lot. Uh, I sometimes say revolutions are as common as grass in world history, and they all look impossible before they happen. So I'm not a utopian in the sense that it's inevitable. But it would be very surprising if this weren't a dark period and people felt pessimistic. That's the time to begin laying the groundwork and reaching out. Uh, and we'll see. I'm not totally pessimistic either. I'm, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see. A lot of folks on our side. Great. Okay. Should be another question coming up here. Gar, what's your perspective on the Occupy movement? Where does it go from here? Okay, take it away. <laughs> well, you know, first, you know, I think it was a just a wonderful uh, rejuvenation of the country. So uh, I'm a great fan of what happened in, in the Occupy movement. Uh, secondly, I, you know, I, I don't presume to try to tell the Occupy movement what it should do. That's folks there have their ideas, uh, rightly so. But I do think, um, you know, in terms of what I think is happening in the country, the starting locally, figuring out what you can do, both the theory, this is not just about projects. Um, I really like projects that are positive and creative, but I'm against projectism. That is to say, it ain't all projects. You must have, a, you're talking about changing the net, uh, system, corporate capitalism. If you don't like corporate capitalism, don't like state socialism, what is it you want? You don't want just projects. You want to change the way we organize ourselves as a society. That means projects, yes, but also theory and developing what it looks like. How do we really put it together? And 
you know, we've been writing, the book I mentioned, America Beyond Capitalism, tries to do that, but there are many people trying to do that simultaneously. So, uh, you know, if I had anything to suggest to the occupiers, the spirit is great, keep doing what you're doing. Find some local projects that are particularly ones that democratize the ownership of wealth, co-ops and worker-owned companies or land trusts, as opposed to corporate ownership or 1% ownership. But also begin thinking, really, where does it lead? How do we get beyond, how do we put projects together to talk about system change rather than just projectism? Oh, boy, here's a question. I get this one a lot, and it's a, it's a good question. What can you do if you're young, just out of college, and living back with your parents. <laughs> I've, I've, my daughter came home to live with us for a while. <laughs> she said this some time ago, and uh, it was great actually to have her there. So maybe your parents might like that part of it too. Uh, wash the dishes was one thing we <laughs> you could do. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know. I think it. I think obviously there's, I mean I do think, take that seriously, it's a responsibility to work out a cooperative relationship with your parents when you're an adult. But also um, it's a time when you probably got, you're looking for work, but there's also time to try to do some creative things in the community of the kind we're talking about or the kind that's on that website I mentioned, work uh, www.community-wealth. Um, and also, you know, it's in one sense, it's an opportunity to really rethink the direction you're going. Um, most people would, what, would love much better to be able to get that job and get that car and get that house, and that's the way we've been brought up. But it's a time to rethink as well, that maybe there's a whole new direction that would involve some form of participating in the old economy, but also building the new. Um, I'm seeing a lot of folks, you know, I've been speaking around the country, and there are a lot of people struggling with the question that, that you're raising uh, and trying, trying it out. And, and the other thing I, I guess I would say is it's really important not to be alone. That is, the small groups, Margaret Mead used to say, some people think small groups don't matter, and her argument was nothing ever changes. They all start with small groups. That's six people decide to sit in in the civil rights movement. And, things crystallize. So, you know, there are probably six people who are like you, living with their parents, getting together and talking about that, but also talking about what might be done both personally and, and socially and politically is probably the way to go. But isolation doesn't help. Mm, yeah, that's, those are really good answers. I, I don't have kids, so I, I don't have uh, you know, anyone in my household who's, who's in that situation. But I remember being in that situation back in the uh, early 1970s, and uh, and uh, you know there's a uh, old saying which is you know uh, freedom is having nothing left to lose, uh, and it, I have to say uh, you know of course the economic situation in the early 1970s is very different from now, but there were a lot of us who were. Uh, who were living on practically nothing because we saw that the, uh, the mainstream society uh, of, you know, <laughs> Mad Men and, <laughs> uh, you know, Madison Avenue and, and, uh, and, and corporate America was just going in a, uh, a terribly wrong direction and we were willing to forego the, the comforts in order to, you know, find some other way. Um, you know, I think... Uh, Voluntary poverty is, is something that doesn't get uh, much uh, support in a country like the U.S. Uh, nobody even, I hardly ever even hear that phrase used uh, anymore. But uh, frankly, I think uh, a, a state of voluntary poverty on the part of, of uh, an, you know, organized young group. Uh, groups of, of people is is almost a necessary prerequisite for the the freedom and the uh, and the unattached authenticity uh, necessary in order to really 
build something genuinely new uh, for what it's worth. I don't know. And a, and a time to, you know, to rethink everything. It's really yeah. rare that you get that time because painful as it is, you, you know, if you go right into that first job and up the ladder, that's it. You, you put on the blinders. And what you're saying, and I agree, that one of the advantages is you get to really rethink things if you take advantage of the time and space, and then you may actually get control of your life rather than just get on that, that ladder. Yeah. Okay. How do we change the conversation in the municipal regional planning context from focus on economic development? Uh, it's the questions cut off. Business attraction, retention. I'm not sure what the rest of the question says. Um, question. This is questions from me. Eva, so how do we change the conversation in the municipal regional planning context? Well, hmm. that, one, that one we've had some actual real experience with, which um, uh, we're in the middle of preparing a 10-year regional plan uh, in Flagstaff. Um, one of the, th I mentioned this Cleveland project, uh, uh, which is a series of worker, large-scale worker-owned cooperatives. So for instance, that means they're just about to open a um, 3.5 acre uh, hydroponic greenhouse capable of producing 3 million heads of lettuce a year. It's not, these are not small. There's a very big industrial scale laundry. They work around companies. Uh, there's a solar installation company that's on track to put in more solar installation than now exists in the entire state of Ohio and several other businesses. They are linked together. This is the model that may give you, I'm, I'm suggesting some ideas that, that are on the ground now and that can be applied elsewhere because many cities are trying to do this. Um, and secondly, most cities have big hospitals and universities and they have a lot of public money, Medicare, Medicaid, education money. And they buy a lot. In this particular neighborhood, they spend three billion dollars a year plus salaries, plus construction, just buying three billion, none of it from the neighborhood. Well, if you want to get beyond attracting, one of the ways to do it is turn that money towards community and cooperatively owned companies that are going to build the community that are using some of their profits to pour back in that are linked together. Uh, and you begin to build a very different vision of community stability rather than trying to attract new companies. And what you get, interestingly, is you get many small business people like this. This is they're not against it because it helps the local community in a very different spirit. We're finding this model, and it's, if you look on that website, it's uh, www.community-wealth or the Evergreen Cooperatives in Cleveland. A uh, number of cities, are, there's Atlanta, Pittsburgh, um, one of the cities in Texas, is, there are three or four in, in Maryland are now beginning to do this, and they find very unusual coalitions trying to answer the question directly uh, that the person from Flagstaff's uh, offering. And I think it's, a, it's an answer to the, the mayor all of a sudden has an answer, if he looks at it the proper way, to just by bribing some corporation to come in who may, and the corporation may leave you know, in a few years. Um, there's a whole new model developing and it's involved in changing who owns things, cooperative ownership, democratizing ownership. And it's very, very interesting because the politics of it work uh, in, in it, it gets beyond ideologies at the national level to local people saying, hey, this is practical. Uh, and it's a very, uh, so we're, we're quite, uh, you can find more about it at their website, community-wealth, but it can be done in any community and is being done in many communities. You can do it in, in Cleveland or Pittsburgh or Atlanta. You can do it in Flagstaff if you find out about it and do your homework and it better be practical. You've got to work, I mean, one of the things that's there's a lot of rhetoric, but rolling up your sleeves and figuring out what does it really mean to get serious about changing these structures, um, that can be done. I, I'm, I'm about, starting at the local level where the pain levels are highest. National, there are other things that, you know, more political things, but locally, uh, there's enough going on that people realize something new has to be done. And if you really thought about it enough and looked around the country, there are a lot of things that other people are doing that can be done in any community. 
Yeah, I like your your phrase where the where the pain levels are highest in the local community because that's that's what's going on. You know, uh, uh, budgets are being cut at the national level, the state level, and uh, and so counties and cities are are kind of being uh, cut cut adrift, and so because uh, they're they're no longer beholden to these higher levels of uh, of organization, then there's more freedom there actually to experiment and do do different things. So, um, uh, crisis equals opportunity once again. Freedom, freedom and pain. Um, I sometimes <laughs> put it this way: the 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 community. I'm from Racine, Wisconsin, an industrial town with you know difficulties in Wisconsin. Uh, these towns. The Clevelands, the Racines, other towns. That's the far end of the internal empire. It's the and the empire doesn't solve the problems there, and it's where rebuilding at the pain level uh, becomes real. Uh, so uh, there's a lot that you can there's a lot that needs doing, but it is not without hope. When you think if you think you're going to challenge the monster head on at the top, you probably ought to take another think. But if you think we might build up step by step by step from the communities step by step from the bottom, there's a lot of us and a lot of folks who might be do, doing some building if you think over time, decade by decade. I sometimes say, you want to play this game? The chips are decades of your life. Don't play unless you understand it's a long-term process. That's, that's the name of the game. So uh, come, on, come on and play. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, okay, question from uh, Gabrielle. Do you think Community-based initiatives should be complemented with top-down measures such as caps on consumption. Uh, well, my two cents is caps on consumption. Great idea. I'd support it, but it's a pretty tough sell for uh, the vast majority of people. I, I would say that the caps on consumption are, are, are going to be administered by the, by the economy as it contracts. But uh, that's not to say there aren't top-down uh, policies that couldn't help along the way. And, uh, and certainly the, the, uh, you know, the, the large-scale institutions, national governments, uh, state governments, are going to have to respond in some way to these, these changing uh, uh, circumstances. So of course we should be lobbying for more sensible responses rather than rather than uh, you know nonsensical and destructive, and uh, you know, whether it's with regard to the environment and climate or with regard to financial regulations or uh, all the rest. So. Yeah, I agree. I think the uh, there are some opportunities at the national level, um, some, and I think two that are important. Uh, most, of, most of the opportunities aren't there, but I think so, there are in some areas. I think the banking system is going to go into crisis again, uh, and probably multiple times. And, uh, you know, probably people will try to re-regulate them, and that will fail, because they've got too much power, or they may break them up, and then that will fail because the big fish will eat the little fish. So at some point, uh, I don't think there is a regulatory answer. In theory, there is, but I don't think that with the decline of the progressive power and the decline of labor, I don't think you can make it stick. And I don't think there's an antitrust break them up answer because I think they'll get around that too and just get back to what they've been doing. So I think they're going to re-agglomerate. And at some point, you know, the answer is you're going to have to take them over and make them into public utilities. Uh, I think that progression is real because I think they're going to screw up and make real problems and people are angry enough. And after you try all the other reforms that they can get around, I think people are going to say enough is enough. But that's the next couple decades. I don't think that's immediate, but I think that's the way you ought to think about it. We're looking for something that works. Um, so that's a big national solution, but I think they're so irresponsible with the way they're playing and they cause so much pain and people understand it that at some point some of the big guys will be made into utilities, that just public ownership. Um, Secondly, I think the health system ultimately is going to be a public system. And that's slow and agonizing, but the pain levels are going to really increase over time. 
and I think people are going to start seeing people thrown out of hospitals on the street the way they were and feeling it themselves and the costs are going to go up. And some of the big corporations are going to be also angry because they're global competition. They're not going to like the cost structure. So there's a divide and conquer possibility there for a real medical solution. So yeah, there are some areas and, you know, healthcare is going to be 20% of the economy and the big banks run another big chunk of the economy. So it is not impossible to see crisis development in which those situations could be brought under control in parallel to the, the local development. But I, I think the local place is to start, but there may well be opportunities nationally over time. Yeah. Unfortunately, those, those national opportunities are currently hindered by the incredibly dysfunctional political system. And, uh, and it's hard to see how that's going to get sorted out anytime soon. But, uh, Not soon. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Not soon. Decade by decade. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, what do we have next here? You're 400 out of 160 million, or, or 400 compared to 160 million stat was shocking. How do you see redistribution going by force or voluntarily to save society? That's an interesting question. Step by step. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think people first need to get a sense of the different, of an alternative society. So a co-op, or a land trust, or a municipal, you know, 25% of the American electricity is now municipal owned, democratized ownership, or co-ops. It's, it's not private corporations. Uh, people have to have an alternative idea of a more cooperative community. And, and there's a lot of very American forms of this, not state socialism or big bureaucracies, local things like co-ops and land trusts and municipal enterprise and that kind of build up I think needs to be the way people think about what they want rather than just redistribution. Now there's a whole role for uh, taxing as well simply to redistrib redistrib redistribute and also use that money for social programs. I agree with that. But I think ultimately the, the only way forward is if you get a whole different vision that this is really crazy that 400 people have more wealth than 160 million do we want to build a society that alters the structure? If you don't like corporate capitalism, you don't like state socialism, how do we build a new society from the bottom up that really begins to change? And, you know, America has one great advantage. We're not like France, for instance, or Russia, where things really are much more centralized. We have a decentralist tradition that could be built upon uh, that honors communities and states in a way that could be very progressive if we begin taking advantage of it. But the image that, that will allow for a change in distribution, I think, has to be something we develop and practice in, in our own lives. And then you've got a different leverage on the 100, you know, 100 to 400 people. Uh, that doesn't mean politics is unimportant, but it means that it, it, if it's informed by a different vision, I think it has more power. Mm, yeah. Uh, my guess is that uh, uh, not so much redistribution, but a massive destruction of, of paper wealth is almost inevitable uh, in de defaults on uh, 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 debt that's currently held at the highest levels in, in society. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, there, as we're seeing in, in Europe, you know, that, that's going to happen uh, only as a last resort, they're going to try to avoid default as long as they possibly can. But at some point, it's, it, it is more or less inevitable. And so, you know, you could call that redistribution, but it's, uh, it's really just a matter of, uh, of wealth destruction. And, and you know, at, at the end of it, you end up with a, a somewhat more equitable society. But uh, unless, unless you're doing it in, in some kind of... Uh, uh, de deliberate, planned way, you still end up with some people having much more power than others and, uh, and trying to protect that. So if, if somehow uh, uh, we can understand the trajectory of history here and try to get hold of this process and, and, uh, and plan for it, we'll certainly do much better than if we just sort of let these forces chaotically uh, crash against one another. And, 
watch the worst case emerge. And destroy people's uh, you know, home ownership and pension ownership and that, that part of it. I agree, I agree with you. That's it's critical. One of the things I do want to say is you know, to encourage people to read your book because it's it's the only book that that I know. Your work is the only place where you see both putting together the financial question and the real questions of material growth. Nobody's done that in the way that you have, and it's really very important work that brings the pieces together, the, the financial crisis and how the growth system has to change at both levels and, and why, we're, why the crisis is deepening. So, so plug for the book. But of course, because appreciate you know, your saying. Uh, not, not, not very few people have done what you've done, Richard. Very important. Mm. What's giving you hope or optimism right now? And it's, you know, let's take that as, as literally as we can. You know, what's maybe what's happened most recently just in the last, uh, uh, that's most hope giving? Well, I'm going to have to stew on that for a second. Is there anything you can say to that? Well, if it's right now, I've just come back from a conference. Um, called Bali, B Business Alliance for Local Living Local Economies. Uh, and that's been primarily small business people in communities that, you know, not, they don't like unions too much and they're not too interested in black people in the poorer parts of the country and the, they haven't taken on the big corp the banks, they, they don't like them, but, but they're very excited about an ecologically healthy local community development and small business integrity. So a lot of integrity. And it was a very interesting conference and very exciting because this group is reaching out and aware of and bringing in, not, you can't do it just by small business, even the best, and you can't do it just by communities. You've got to reach out to the poor black community, the brown community. You have to begin talking about systemic issues, not just local economies. So it, it's a process of opening up. Uh, and that process, not only in, that's, that was to me very encouraging, but I've been seeing that elsewhere where people are beginning to say, hey, there is a larger set of issues here. We may start at one corner, but there are sy systemic questions. And that the, the moral integrity of what we're doing is challenged if we don't reach beyond our own little sandbox. And uh, so there was a lot of wonderful energy in this uh, unexpectedly to me because I respect what these folks are doing just as small business community trying to do environmentally interesting things, build a t community, but not systemic vision and not reaching out. So the shift that I see driven, I think, by the problem of moral integrity. You can't keep your integrity when you look over there and people are at you know, 18,000 average family income and unemployment of 40% rate. You can't, not, you can't ignore that. And you know there's a systemic problem when cities like Cleveland are wiped out off the map. And you can look the other way, but people, I think, are being beginning to look at the system question. So that was very uh, encouraging to me to just see this particular development just last weekend. Yeah, that's great. I guess the way I'd answer that question is it's more subjective. You know, I've, I've been home for the last... Uh, uh, a couple of weeks off off the road, which my favorite place to be is is at home and being in the garden and and uh, uh, of course it's late spring right now and everything is just so bounteous uh, and uh, and our chickens are laying and and just watching even animal behavior you know chickens are not necessarily very smart but they have this dogged determinism determination if they <laughs> if they want something, they will just keep going for it until if they can possibly do it, they'll get out from under that fence or do whatever it is that <laughs> they need to do. And, you know, I think we human beings are, are, are like that too. You know, we, we can be advertised at, we can be threatened, uh, we can, you know, be sub subjected to all kinds of systems to try to force us to be a certain way. But uh, given the historic necessity, I think we're going to um, do a lot of things that may seem impossible right now uh, over the course, as, as you say, Gar, over, over the course not just of days and weeks, but, uh, but, but months and years ahead. So this has been a great uh, uh, opportunity, I think, for me to have a
this conversation with you, Gar. I've really enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, to, uh, I hope folks uh, who've been listening and watching have, have enjoyed it too. It's going to be available on our website. And uh, thank you so much for, for this thank conversation you. and for your wonderful work. And, and yours as well. Thanks, Richard.